Name that tune. He's reaching out to you. What is it? Reach out to Jesus. Okay. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Paul trains Aquila and Priscilla to stand for the truth. Chapter 18 finishes with Paul and his second missionary journey. No sooner does he end the second missionary journey, he jumps right into the third missionary journey. God constantly opened doors for Paul, and Paul took advantage of those open doors willingly. Uh, opportunities arose. He was a great example for us as well as we go through our daily walk of life to witness along the way. We can see almost everywhere Paul went, people were converted, churches were established. Though it never failed, when churches started to grow, opposition always showed up. I'm going to begin with Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 3, and out of reverence for God and His holy word, would you stand with me for the reading of our text? Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found certain Jews named Aquila, born of Pontus, who had recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for Christian hospitality, for people that have opened their homes. And Father, we pray that we will continue to be that type of people. Guide us and direct us, but help us to learn from Paul and his travels and his mission work and from Aquila and Priscilla and their witness for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And be seated, please. The first main point this uh, morning is when opposition arrived, Paul moved on. He realized the door was closed. They were not receptive, and there are other places he needed to be. Acts 18, verse 4 through 5 says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuading both Jews and Greeks, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Wherever he went, that was his message, that Jesus is the Christ. Not long after his arrival, Paul is joined by two close companions, co-workers in the Lord's work, Silas and Timothy. Here in Corinth, Paul is compelled by the Spirit. He gets involved. He's testifying to the Jews. And according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Silas and Timothy came with good news regarding the church in Thessalonica. So Paul writes his, first, his epistle rather to 1 Thessalonians in response to such news. In Acts 18, verse 6 through 8, the Bible shows opposition arose. When they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garment and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. I guess today they would say that Paul was not a seeker-friendly preacher. <laughs> he was not trying to appease the people. He was not trying to just get along. He presented the truth. If they did not receive it, he moved on. So Paul washed his hands of working with the Jews in the synagogue there and began meeting with others in the home of Titus justice. Look at verse 7. He departed from there, entered into the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> he didn't move far away, did he? Uh, he was going into the synagogue, witnessing there, and they rejected him. So he goes next door <laughs> and stays with Justice, and there begins meeting with folks there. One can only uh, imagine if this was Titus Justus, to whom Paul later wrote the book of Titus. 
I can just imagine it wasn't long before word got out to those in the synagogue. I think I saw Paul next door. And he was witnessing to some people. I saw people gather around him. And he was teaching them in the home of Titus Justus. And I'm sure those non-believing Jews who were not happy when Paul was in the synagogue were definitely not happy now that Paul is teaching and has a gathering next door to the synagogue. But look what happened in verse 8. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. The second main point is the order of some of the steps of salvation. This verse is loaded. Look what it says. First, not only did some of the Jews from the synagogue become believers, but here we find that Crispus now has become a believer, a follower of Christ. He's the ruler of the synagogue. Not only was he involved and he receptive, but his whole household as well. You might say he was the president of the synagogue, and so he became a follower of Christ. Not only are they upset that Paul is preaching next door, but Paul now has converted one of their own. In fact, he's converted their chief ruler, you might say, of the synagogue. Obviously, he's been sharing with his household as, as uh, Christmas would go home uh, and, and meet with his family and his household He's been sharing with them what he's been hearing by the Apostle Paul because not only is he converted, but also his entire household. And so we notice on secondly, we find an order of some of the steps of salvation presented very plainly here. The Bible says, hearing, believed, and were baptized. In this simple outline, we find some of the main steps of salvation and in what order they took place biblically. Subpoint A, they heard. They heard. They listened. They, they took in the message from God's Word. People cannot believe in God until they first of all heard. Somebody can't just walk in the church house for the first time without reading the Bible, without hearing some messages on Jesus and say, I, I'm a believer, I want to obey, I want to be saved. You can't believe until you've heard. You need to listen. You need to take in the message from God's Word. Look what Romans 10 verse 17 says. So then faith, that's belief, faith cometh by what? Hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So from where should this information come? Well, I, I read today in the Reader's Digest. I noticed in the newspaper. I saw in a magazine. No. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we've got to get people into the Bible. Subpoint B, they believed. Hearing, they believed. For what? Jesus also said in Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he who believes not shall be condemned. And Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, or rather verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Subpoint C shows biblically they were baptized. Hearing, believed, and were baptized. Remember again, verse 8 says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Does it actually say now that Crispus, was baptized, or are we just assuming this? Well, actually, we do have proof, and this is where rightly dividing the Word of God comes in. We find later Paul wrote about some division that had risen in the church, and 
he was thankful that he had personally not baptized very many so people wouldn't be divided by being a follower of Paul. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Paul said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me concerning you by my brethren, by those of the Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. There's division, there's friction. Paul was explaining when one is converted, it doesn't matter who it is that's baptizing them, and the church should not be divided over who it was that taught them or baptized them. And in, in doing so, he proves that Crispus was indeed baptized, for in fact, Paul personally baptized him. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 through 16. Now I say this, that each of you say, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, or Peter, and I of Christ. Paul said, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And here's what he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so he names him here. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I, I do not know whether I baptized any of them. Paul's mission was to preach. He didn't have to be the one who physically baptized people. So notice again the biblical order of, of some of the steps of salvation. Hearing, belief, and baptism. Reading once again... In Acts 18, verse 8, where is it found? Acts 18, verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. So the question is today, have you heard the truth of God's Word? Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and are you ready to be baptized, immersed into Christ for the remission of your sins? Main point number three. God again speaks to Paul in a vision. In verse 9 through 11, it says, And the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God and uh, being among them. Much of Paul's faith and his confidence in his preaching came from that vision where the Lord said, you go, you preach, I will be with you, and no harm will come to you there. Therefore, Paul remained there a year and a half preaching and teaching uh, Jesus and also wrote the book of 2 Thessalonians while there. In verses 12 through 16, the non-believing Jews brought Paul to the judgment seat and accused Paul and Silas of persuading the people to worship God contrary to the law of Moses. And remember again, all of their faith is, is in Moses. But Gallio would not even hear their case and drove them out of the court. Remember again, the promises made, and promises kept by God. Can we trust God in his promises? Oh, yes. So Gallio kicked the Jews out before he, uh, because he figured out this was a religious matter, was no concern of his to begin with, and he wouldn't even hear it. Paul was totally unharmed when brought before the judgment seat. It appears now that after Crispus was converted, he no longer is chief ruler of the synagogue. Sosthenes steps in, becomes the new ruler of the synagogue, and he was going along with the non-believing Jews who took Paul and drugged him before the legal authorities here. Possibly, Sosthenes was out to destroy Paul for converting their leader, Crispus, and yes, his evil attempt backfired. So the Greeks jumped Sosthenes for stirring up the people and getting nowhere, and therefore they beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio simply looked away. 
he could care less. This was not a, a legal matter. This was a religious situation. And yet we read of Sosthenes, who was converted, a Sosthenes, could have been the same one, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul writing to the church there, says, uh, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. And so it possibly could be the, the same one who once was out to persecute Paul, now has himself become a believer and a follower of Christ. Once again, we learn to rightly divide it, the word of truth. We must put it all together. Paul is finishing up his second missionary journey. Look in Acts 18, verse 89. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut at century, and he had taken a vow. So uh, we're not just talking about a haircut. You might say, well, I got my hair trimmed a little bit, whatever. Uh, but he, he got his head shaven, and it was part of taking a vow. We don't know what the reason was for this, but possibly it showed that he had respect for the custom of their day. When, uh, whenever someone was under a vow or commitment, they would shave their heads. It probably got the attention of the people. Look at verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And so and here in the synagogue, Paul, with a shaven head, showed his respect for the custom, and no doubt the Jewish people took notice and probably listened maybe more intently. Even though in Antioch is north of Jerusalem, the Bible says he went down to Antioch. So there's several criticisms people use to try to refute the Bible and say, well, the Bible's not true. You can't believe the Bible. And here's why. Everybody knows that Antioch is, is north uh, of Jerusalem and, and not this in this direction. But it's not talking about that. He went down to Antioch, uh, for it was downhill in altitude, not down south in that respect of Jerusalem. Arriving back in Antioch, he ended his second missionary journey. And after a long and successful stay in Corinth, Paul left Corinth, leaving behind Aquila and Priscilla, in whose house he stayed while there in Corinth. And no sooner does Paul end his second missionary journey than he begins his third. Look in verse 23, Luke begins recording Paul's third missionary journey. And remember when Paul left, on this journey, he left Aquila and Priscilla, who later ended up having church in their home. And we also know they were responsible for converting a preacher by the name of Apollos. So Paul arrives in Caesarea, went to Antioch, and after staying there for some time, he went on to Galatia and Persia, strengthening the disciples. But now, point number four. We find now a preacher who needed to be brought up to date. Look in Acts 18, verse 24 through 26. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the Spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This couple had spent enough time with Paul <laughs> that they had caught the vision of evangelism and standing up for the Lord. They had been influenced by Paul's ministry. They knew they needed to say something. And so they did. The New Testament had not been written at the time, so it's not very much that Paulus could go back and search the Scriptures and find more about this Jesus and the baptism into Christ. He was still preaching the baptism of John. Remember, he was a follower of John. He was a convert of John. And so he knew a lot about John, but not uh, understanding the baptism into Christ. So with Paul being gone... They did the next best thing. They stepped up to the plate, and they said something to him. 
So they took him aside, the Bible says, they took him unto them, and they needed to get involved. Now it's true, some know very well what the Bible says, what God requires, and yet they refuse to preach it and teach it. However, I believe with Apollos, it's a different situation. Apollos was not yet informed and did not know any better because they had not been taught that part of the truth. We'll find in this biblical record a dedicated couple who loved the Lord more than they feared offending somebody. Offending a preacher, saying something to somebody who's standing up teaching the Word of God, because he was, he was good. He was a convincer. He, he had a following. And they felt it was their responsibility to share with him the whole truth. So to begin, let's consider the man Apollos. Apollos was a man with great zeal, great talent. Even before his conversion, he served the Lord greatly, the Bible says, at least in response to what he knew. Some point A, Apollos was not telling the whole truth. Apollos was not telling the whole truth. Now, it wasn't he was leaving something out, he just didn't know. The Greek word says he was eloquent. In other words, he was very convincing. Apollos was fervent in the spirit. He was on fire for God. He was zealous in, in preaching and teaching. Today, we wonder sometimes if we have the truth but do we have the zeal? We know the truth of God's Word, but do we have the zeal enough to get out and tell other people about Christ? For Apollos knew only the baptism of John, verse 25. So it's important that we note what he was preaching was true to the Bible, but it was outdated. John was sent by God to prepare people for the coming of Christ and the kingdom was about to be established. Even though John's baptism was by immersion, John's baptism was not a baptism into Christ to contact the blood, the death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of their sins. They did not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by John's baptism, which we'll talk about more in chapter 19. So Apollos spoke boldly, the Bible says, and I believe he probably got that from being around John. John was pretty bold in his preaching and teaching, and he was a follower of John, and so he probably picked up on that. But keep in mind, Apollos was not preaching a lie. He was preaching an outdated message. Let me say that again. Apollos was not preaching a lie. What he was preaching was the truth at that time when John was alive before Christ came along. But now he's preaching an outdated message. Subpoint B. So Apollos was confronted by Aquila and Priscilla. He was confronted by Aquila and Priscilla. Look at verse 26. When Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly, more accurately. Being around Paul... They must have learned to be bold and to speak up when someone needs to say something. Though it is important we notice how they approached Apollos. It was not only important that they say something, but important how they say what they did. You see, we can be correct in what we say and did wrong in how we say it. We can be correct in what we say and did wrong in how we say it. We can be right without being rude. We don't have to offend somebody. We don't have to be mean about what we say. Now note how they approached Apollos, subpoint B, in private. The Bible said they took him unto them. They, they didn't stand up and make a big deal of it. They, they took him aside privately. The Greek word says they, they took him aside. And note, it is not only important that we point out that somebody was wrong, but that we point out to them what is right. Subpoint C, they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly, more accurately. Close is not enough when it comes to one's salvation. 
You'd say, well, they, they pray, they believe in God, they read their Bible, uh, they may not do this and this, but, they, but, you know, they're religious. It's not enough to be religious if you're not a child of God. So they were building, Aquila and Priscilla were building on what he already knew with what he needed to know. It appears that Pilate was capable of being taught. He was willing to listen. And here's the best part of it all, and that is the results of their confrontation with him. Look at verse 27 and 28. And when he had disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. Other churches, they, they sent letters here telling him, Receive him, who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now Apollos has gone on to be a great preacher, do great work, win many souls, and strengthen the church, convincing the people that Jesus is the Christ. Obviously, not only was Apollos baptized, but we'll see over in Acts chapter 19, as Paul taught others who were baptized of John. But it also appears Apollos went on to do great work for the Lord. The church even gave him a letter of recommendation there in verse 27. The Bible says he helped the church greatly, mightily convinced the Jews by Scripture that Jesus is the Christ. In fact, Apollos is so beneficial to the cause of Christ that later he is listed right alongside of the Apostle Paul, who later wrote, re, wrote rebuking the church for having such division. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. While one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Uh, who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I had planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. Who is this Apollos now? Right alongside the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I, I, planted, I planted the seed. I, I told people about Jesus. Apollos came along. And he just watered it. He just followed up where I left off. And he converted these people. And the Lord gave the increase. So Paul thought, I, I, I introduced you. But it was Apollos who followed up. Now the question is, where do you stand with the Lord? Have you heard what you need to hear about Jesus Christ? Have you heard and understood? Do you believe with all your heart? And are you willing to obey? Will you come now? Will you surrender and obey more perfectly, obeying the truth, so we can together speak the same thing, be on the same page, witness to people the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? What's the biblical pattern we see there? They heard, they believed, and they were baptized. Pretty good outline, isn't it? And that's what the Bible shows. That's why we teach what we teach. Now, if you're right with the Lord, praise God. If you've obeyed, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, if you've confessed Him publicly, been baptized, immersed into Christ, to wash away your sins, wonderful. Then the point is, get busy telling other people. Aquila and Priscilla were not a, a preacher. <laughs> uh, they, they were not any leaders or whatever in the church. They were a husband and wife team. Had been around Paul, been influenced. And they realized there's times we need to do something. You know, how many times you hear people say, why doesn't somebody do something? <laughs> and they realized they were somebody. They opened up their home. They had church in their home. And Apollos came along preaching, but he knew only the baptism of John. And so they took him aside and taught him the word of God more perfectly. 
Apollos not only obeyed, but went on to do a great work for the Lord. And we give that tribute and we give that recognition to Apollo, Aquila and Priscilla for standing up and saying something and teaching him. Look how many people benefited because they put him on the right track and got him where he needed to be. We're going to stand and sing this morning, 366, I Surrender All. I hope that's the right one this morning. I Surrender All. And if you're here and outside of Christ, you have a decision to make for the Lord. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing? All to Jesus I 